Okay, so first, second, third John for beginners, that's the name of the course. Uh, this is lesson number six. Life in the Early Church is the title of this uh, particular lesson and uh, we're doing Third John, Third John. So this is our final class in this series uh, of uh, study on the epistles of uh, the Apostle John. So the, the, the first two of his three letters were mainly a defense of Christian doctrine against a, a kind of hybrid Gnosticism that attempted to merge Greek philosophical ideas with the Christian gospel. That's, that's, what, that's what was happening, that's what was being taught. Uh, this caused both discouragement and division in the church where this was happening and so John writes his first two epistles to address these false teachings, both warning the false teachers about what they were doing and reassuring the church as to the content, the power and the result of the true gospel in the life of every Believer, that's what false doctrine does. It, 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 it undermines our faith. It undermines our faith. And if our faith is undermined, then our confidence, we lose our confidence, we lose our confidence, we lose our hope, we lose our hope, you know, every, everything you know, falls from there. Um, an interesting feature of this third letter we're about to study is that aside from its teaching content, this epistle also provides a glimpse into the workings of the first century church. Uh, it seems that at that time, much of the ministry was carried out by itinerant or traveling preachers who would go from congregation to congregation preaching and teaching as they went. In each place they would preach publicly and they would hold meetings in the homes where they were staying as guests. There was always the danger of abuse in this system because false teachers and swindlers could easily take advantage of the hospitality of the kind and trusting people who were providing them with that hospitality. So in this environment, hospitality was a very important element in the life and growth of the church. It was risky, but it was necessary. So John's third letter mentions three men in the church. Uh, one who offered hospitality, one who didn't, and one who was in need of this hospitality. So let's just look at the characters that are going to be spoken of in this, uh, in this letter. The first is Gaius, who supported and fed and took care of these traveling uh, preachers, offered uh, hospitality in his home. Diotrephes, who would not receive these people or even allow them to preach, even the good ones. Uh, and then there's Demetrius, one who needed the help or needed the hospitality. Uh, possibly Demetrius was a messenger, a missionary sent by John. So in his letter, John commends Gaius. He warns Diotrephes of a test of authority when he, John, would come to visit in person. And he also commends Demetrius, the preacher, to them. I mean, this situation here was just about power and the use of that power in the church. One man exerting his authority to maintain power and control. So with this in mind, here's a possible outline for 3 John. This outline is going to help us see the flow of the thinking as we review the letter uh, line by line. So we begin, of course, the first part is the introduction. And John says, the elder, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. So John doesn't name himself because the recipient knows him and is aware of his position and his role in the church. He also uses the same introduction as second John, same, same introduction. Now his use of the term elder suggests that he was known by this time as the last surviving apostle, advanced in years, filled with wisdom and the spirit. It was a reference to him alone as the elder. Notice he doesn't say one, one of the elders or an elder, but he says the elder. So you know, they understood who the elder was in the church at that time. In other words, where church leaders were concerned, the reference was always to the elders. Here he says the elder. His connection to Gaius 
is the same as the connection to all others. He loved him in connection with the truth. Now the truth, of course, here is the gospel itself and all that the gospel produces in a person. So his love for Gaius has been produced by the truth in him and motivated by the fact that Gaius shares with John and others the knowledge and the belief in this truth. It's the, it's the thing that binds all of us together, isn't it? Different people, different backgrounds, different nationalities, different uh, education, you know, different, everything different. And yet we come together easily, why? Because we're united in the truth. We believe the same thing about Jesus Christ and that's what motivates our actions. Not only our actions, you know, how we live in the world, but it motivates our actions and our relationship with, uh, with one another. So the elder apostle loves Gaius because he is a faithful brother in the Lord and loves him in this manner. So this is the agape love, right? That uh, we talk about in the New Testament. Second section is the blessings, or the blessing rather, verses uh, uh, two to four, just verse two, he says, beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul Prosper. So John says that his prayers are for Gaius' material and physical well-being as well as his spiritual well-being. A complete blessing considers all facets of life, material, physical, and spiritual. In essence, John prays for a, actually a balanced life. That's what he wants. He wants for Gaius a balanced life enriched in every area of life, material, okay, physical, spiritual, emotional, Verse, uh, verse three, he goes on to say, for I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth. That is how you are walking in truth. And so John's happy to offer this prayer. It's almost reflexive because the news on Gaius is that he continues to be faithful to the gospel truth. Don't, don't we feel the same way? You meet somebody you haven't seen in a while, you know, from another congregation, you know, maybe you used to go to church together. Or something. Oh, how's so-and-so, and how's so-and-so? And, and, and brother, you know, brother Joe, how's he doing? You know, I, is he still a deacon? And, and then you hear, no, actually, they, they put him as one of our elders. He's one of our elders now. Oh, really? Oh, wow, that's wonderful, right? Aren't you happy to hear that somebody is going forward in Christ? And conversely, aren't we unhappy when we hear, yeah, oh, Brother Joe, we haven't seen him in months. We don't know, he doesn't come anymore. You know, and that's always disappointing, right? We always are encouraged by seeing the, the progress of our brothers and sisters uh, in Christ Jesus. So this is exactly the feeling that John is expressing about Gaius. He, he hears about Gaius and what Gaius is doing and he's encouraged by his, uh, uh, by his activity. He's walking in the truth means that he lives by the revelation of the gospel and its teaching. You know, we think that responding to the gospel is like just one time act. You know, we believe, we repent, we confess our faith, we're buried in baptism. But walking in truth means that this cycle of response is an ongoing exercise that becomes the substance of our daily life in truth. For example, I continually grow in my knowledge of and belief in the word of God, its application in my life. Every time I read the Bible, every time I, you know, like you, you come to the class, I prepare the class. I'm the one who's blessed. If you've ever taught a Bible class, you know that the teacher always has more blessings. Why? Because the teacher is finding out stuff, usually not enough time to share everything that he's learned, but he or she, if you teach a ladies class or children, but you know what I'm saying, if the teacher receives a great blessing from the study. So I'm constantly challenged by the Holy Spirit about my own life, my own ways, my attitude, and I renew my efforts at repenting and disregarding old worldly and sinful ways for the true and right way to live and to be. And this is not just the MO for those who teach. I mean, the pressure's on for those who teach. Very hard to teach something that you yourself are not making an effort at. You know? It's very difficult to do that. But everyone should be like that. What you read, what you hear, should become part of who you are spiritually. 
and I grow bolder and more adept at confessing Christ with my life, my words, my service, my giving, my sacrifice. You know, the very first time that I confessed Christ or I repented, you know, when I first did it, it was a cold November night in front of two people and I was immersed in the water at the Lachine Church of Christ in Montreal, November 1977. But that was not the last time I confessed Christ. I mean, for the, fir the first time I confessed Christ, I confessed it in front of two people, Jim Metter and Bob, some, uh, Bob Adams. Two people. But in the last 40 years, I have confessed Christ Millions maybe? I've been blessed. The Lord has provided me a platform, a pulpit and now an electronic pulpit to continue confessing Christ. So the point I'm making is not everybody needs to be a preacher, but everybody needs to continue in the confessing of Christ as part of their Christian life. They continue in repentance as an ongoing exercise as part of their Christian life. They continue in understanding the gospel more deeply as they continue their walk in, in Christ. So John sees in Gaius a man who is walking or living in this ongoing truth and he loves to see this in him and it becomes an extension of his love for Christ. So Gaius is a man who didn't just stop at the, on the day he was baptized. He continued day two, day three, day four, day five. He continued to confess Christ, continued in the cycle of repentance and renewal, continued in his understanding of God's word, continued in his ability to demonstrate his faith here in this instance by receiving, by uh, you know, offering hospitality to uh, preachers and being a leader in the church. Verse four, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. As a matter of fact, to see this phenomenon take place in any member of the church causes John the greatest joy. So observing the transformation of another into a more Christ-like image is a very joyful and gratifying experience, especially if you personally have helped to nurture that person in Christ. That person that you may have, that young person, for example, that you may have baptized a, a couple of years ago at camp, or so, you know, I'm just picking an example here, and all of a sudden, you know, a year and a half later, that same young person is getting up and leading the prayer, or perhaps doing a devo for the communion, or, 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 or joining the youth group to go on a mission trip somewhere. You're, you know, and you're in, inside yourself, he's like your spiritual child. You're saying, wow, I remember that young guy, you know. Didn't know much when I started to teach him and look at him now. So this is a universal experience of all Christians. Right? He moves on, <clears throat> third part here of the outline, encouraging workers for the truth, verses five to eight, verse five and six. He writes, beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren and especially when there are strangers and they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. So John commends the work that Gaius and others are doing in providing hospitality for these evangelists, these missionaries that are coming their way. Uh, hospitality comes from a Greek word, which means the love of strangers, the love of strangers. To offer food and lodging to strangers was not only an act of faith, it was also a great uh, effort uh, in, in, in spreading the gospel at that time. You know, John and the church back in Ephesus have heard reports of how Gaius treated the missionaries sent his way in a generous manner. He commends him and he encourages him to continue in this and also provide supplies and resources for their continuing journey after they lead him, leave him. Verse seven and eight. He says, for they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. So first, concerning these missionaries, John says that their sole motivation was their faith in Christ, the name. 
when he says they did it for the name. Well, who, who else is the name, right? They did, it for, they did it for Jesus. And they didn't solicit or accept any payment from those that they preached to, meaning the Gentiles. In those days, itinerant speakers, not just necessarily Christian preachers, but itinerant orators, if you wish, went from place to place talking about various philosophical ideas and debating and so on and so forth, and they would be paid for this. That's how they made their living. He's saying, but these preachers, speakers, you know, they go from place to place and they preach for free. They don't accept any money. What they accept is the generous hospitality uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the brethren. Uh, again, I make a, a personal note, same thing with the uh, Bible Talk, which is part of the ministry of this church. If you go on our website, you never hear me saying, send us money. We do it for free. People call or people, you know, they say, how can I download this? Or they ask permission, sure, you know, download whatever you want. You, know, you want to download 50 videos and make copies and distribute them? Go ahead, why, why can we do this? Well, because the Church of Christ supports this work along with other congregations and individuals. So we're allowed to offer for free material that would cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars. We offer it for nothing to everyone. Why? Because in the same way that these people were supported in the first century to kind of offer the gospel at no cost to Gentiles, we offer the gospel and we offer teaching and so on and so forth at no cost to not Gentiles, but to unbelievers as well as believers, as well as members of the church. Why? Because the church supports this work in the same way that it was done in the first century. After all, are we not a New Testament church? It's the way they did it in the New Testament. It's the way we do it today. So this, this dedication and integrity needs to be supported by believers, he says. After all, if the believers don't support the missionaries, who will? They can't go to you know, uh, Lowe's and, and ask for a, <laughs> a grant. We're not the Boy Scouts or the, you know, some community group. The church does not solicit money from unbelievers. Though even though Gaius is not himself actually teaching and preaching the word, his effort at providing hospitality is his participation. It's his contribution to the overall evangelistic effort. And this, he says, is acceptable by God. So those who support, you know, those who support World Bible School, sending correspondence courses, uh, you know, mainly to Africa these days, uh, and all those baptisms that uh, Steve you know, puts pictures on, on the website and on the bulletin boards, and, People we don't know, they have strange names that are not like our names. We just see pictures of people being baptized and churches being planted. None of us, I, I believe, have ever been to Africa. None of us have actually taught those people, but many, not me, but many of you have sat in the room and corrected the courses. Many of you have you know, written, you know, put answers down to the questions and folded the stuff and mailed it back in the same way that Gaius participated in the mission work of the preachers who were going round and round teaching in those days. Those of you who volunteer and work with World Bible School participate in the success of that ministry and participate also in the blessings that will come for that ministry. So we can't all be in the mission field we all don't have the ability to be effective personal workers, but to the extent that we support and assist this kind of work, we share in that work and we share in the rewards. And that's the point that John is making here. Even though Gaius isn't doing any of the preaching, he shares in the rewards that will come. Why? Because he's supporting that. He's participating in the way that he can. Now he moves on for the, uh, <clears throat> to the problem at hand, re uh, reproving the, uh, the opponents of the truth. In verse nine he says, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. So John focuses on the issue that is the reason for the letter. He has sent a previous letter. Some scholars think he is referring to a letter concerning an instruction to receive certain missionaries you know, from John which Diotrephes refuses to read to the church 
and refuses to honor. Others think that he is referring to his second epistle. Whichever it was, Diotrephes was blocking communication between John and the church in an attempt to challenge John's authority as an apostle and teacher. Keep reading, verse 10. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words, and not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either. And he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. So John now reviews the unacceptable and sinful behavior of Diotrephes. Unjust accusations against John and other leaders. I mean, again, you want to split the church? Start accusing the leaders. Divide the leaders among themselves. You don't have to go after the 400 members, just break up the leadership and you'll eventually break up the church. So this is what's going on here. Uh, he was unwilling to receive teachers and missionaries that were sent there. And between the lines, probably sent there by John. Uh, there's interference with those who try to offer hospitality, even the ones who are ready to you know, accept and, 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 and offer hospitality, he interferes with that. And he creates division by putting out of the church those who oppose him. So this man wanted the power of leadership and tried to undermine John's authority as an apostle and those who responded to John in order to get this power. So this is like an old pattern, nothing new here. This is a, an old pattern used even to this day. Some people in the church desire power and authority and they refuse to follow the leadership in place, so they begin a quiet, sometimes not so quiet, campaign. And it begins with criticism, a campaign of criticism, followed by negative commentary, and then slander uh, against those who have a leadership role. It doesn't start with open warfare, it just starts with a whisper campaign. Do you really think so and so, really? How, how good an elder do you think he is? You know, I mean, really, no, it's just between you and me now. You know? how, how do you think he's doing his job? You know? And that, that moves itself forward to, well, if I was, you know, if I was in charge, if I was, the, if I was an elder, well, you know, things would be different. We'd get things done here, or we'd do things differently here. You know? I, I see some guys who preach smiling <laughs> because they've been through this. But it, there's nothing new about this. It doesn't even have to be in the church. It could be in any kind of organization where there's a leader or leaders. It always starts as a little whispering campaign. John says that he will deal with this person by exposing his sins and misdeeds. And John will expose Diotrephes' sins by shining the truth on them, the light of truth on them. No fist fight, no political intrigue, no debate or contest to see who's better or stronger or smarter. John will demonstrate the other man's weakness by comparing his actions and attitude to the word of truth. That's how he's going to deal with him. If you're thinking that John's going to go to this church and get in there and you know, uh, slap people around and take names, no, 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 that, that's a military way. That's corporate. That's corporate takeover groups that, that act like that. You know. No, no, John says, if I go there, uh, I will show uh, you know, the sinfulness of that activity by shining the light of this truth on that action. And that in itself will be damning uh, and condemning, uh, if you will. So let the gospel judge, that's the point. Let the gospel be the judge. Then the truth will come out and everyone will see and decide for themselves who's right, who's wrong. Verse 11, beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Again, a reminder to Gaius and the church not to be influenced by what this person is doing. It's tempting to fight fire with fire. You hear that all right, well, I got to fight fire with fire, but you didn't get that from the Bible. <laughs> you didn't get that attitude from the New Testament. Evil with evil, power with greater power. 
That's the world, that's how the world operates. But this is the kingdom of God, not the world. Things operate differently in the kingdom of God. They are encouraged, John here encourages the church, they're encouraged to imitate the things that they have been taught that are good in order to count the creeping evil that is making its way into the church. It's good not to succumb to pride and selfish ambition. It's good to receive and offer hospitality to the missionaries. It's good to face evil men by revealing their sins and not sharing in them. John tells them that those who act in this way prove that they are and have been or recognize Jesus as God. And those who do not act in this way neither know the truth nor have they seen or recognized that Jesus truly is God, not just another you know, rabbi. What does Paul say in Romans? We overcome evil with, yeah, good. We don't overcome evil with more evil, you know, fire with fire. No, no, we overcome evil with good. And so John continues, verse 12, commending the witness of truth. So he says, Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our testimony and you know that our testimony uh, is, uh, is true. So John gives a commendation to Demetrius, the teacher missionary, being sent, who may be at the center of this conflict. So John gives three references here for Demetrius. One, the church commends him. The church says Demetrius is a teacher. Demetrius is, you know, is okay. He is sound in the doctrine of the gospel. The truth commends him, meaning that he preaches the truth and lives in accordance to his preaching. And then the elder, meaning John himself, vouches for his character and his work. I, I, I go back to our, our, our own ministry and Bible talk. If, you, if, you, you know, if somebody is watching it and they're thinking of maybe uh, using our material in their church to teach, we have a, you know, there's a section that tells you about the, Bible, uh, about the website itself, about me, who I am, where I come from. But we make sure to put in on our website that uh, BibleTalk.tv is a work of the uh, sponsored and overseen by the Choctaw Church of Christ. And we do that to reassure the people who are using our material that we're not just some kind of Lone Ranger evangelist out there you know, spinning his own ministry. That our ministry is, is folded into the work of a local congregation, which happens to be this one. And it's easy enough for any individual out there to contact the church either you know, through, the, through email or the phone number to find out who we are. And that's necessary to reassure, especially the brethren, that we are in good standing. And our elders who know what we teach, familiar with our work, can vouch for us. And this is what John is doing for Demetrius. He's saying, this is a good guy. The church accepts him. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's sound in the faith. And, the, and John, the elder, also vouches for his uh, character. And that should be enough for, for anyone. And then he moves on to his conclusion, 13 to 15. He says, I had many things to write to you, but I'm not willing to write them to you with pen and ink but I hope to see you shortly and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you, greet the friends uh, by name. So John finishes up with some personal notes on various uh, points. He's formulated many things uh, to say to Gaius, but he decides not to write them, preferring to speak to Gaius you know, face to face. He's sending the letter ahead before his visit to prepare the way. He plans to go there in person shortly after the letter arrives, undoubtedly to arrive without warning and deal with the brother without giving him a chance to stir up trouble in advance. <laughs> if the troublemaker knows that John is coming, he might you know, step up his activity to create more trouble. So he offers the blessing 
that these brethren need peace. He greets the many mutual acquaintances that he and Gaius share. He ends on this positive, personal, and forward-looking note. So there are a couple of lessons here that we can draw from this very brief, very personal letter from John to his Christian friend Gaius concerning the problem of powerful men trying to dominate the church. Again, something that has happened throughout history. Why? Because people are people. People are people. Those who lead in the church are, are, are men, you know, the elders are men, the ministers are, uh, they're sinful men. And for some of these sinful men, one of their problems, one of their sins, one of their weaknesses may be the desire to have and hold power over others. That, that might be their particular sin. So we shouldn't be surprised. So a couple of lessons. One, teaching the truth is important. John commends them for knowing and, and living according to the quote truth. What they say and do and think, how they worship, what they preach and teach, all of it done according to what is true. Another way of saying according to God's word. This is another way, as I say, uh, of saying according to God's word because Jesus says that it is God's word that is true. John 17, 17. The only way this is possible is that they have learned the truth from someone who has taught them. In their case, it may have been John the Apostle himself. So my point here is that in order to live according to the truth, one must be taught the truth. You can't guess. And the task of knowing, teaching, and passing that truth along from generation to generation belongs to the church. 1 Timothy 3.15, right? Paul says the church, the pillar and support of the truth. And within the church, that task falls to every teacher and preacher and ultimately to every elder. So from the nursery class to the adult Bible class, it's important that we are very careful to always teach the truth from God's word and not substitute this for human ideas, no matter how noble those ideas are. We can't live according to the truth and thus be pleasing to God unless we're constantly being taught the truth by those who are responsible for this in ministry. You, you got to do it. That's why every quarter you know, we prepare the adult education. We try to have every quarter, we try to have a class that deals just with a Bible book, a text, an Old Testament book or new, or a, a, a Bible topic, okay, or perhaps a small discussion group type thing that deals with how Christians can deal with various issues. We don't have books on how to be successful in business or you know, how to make friends. You need to go somewhere else for that. Here we get, you know, we get 40 minutes every Sunday, one time, 40 minutes to teach God's word. Imagine if we stop teaching God's word in the church, well, who's going to teach God's word? Nobody. Second truth, those who teach the truth deserve our support. You know, in this congregation alone, and I'm, this is probably a minimum number, there are over 50 people in this congregation directly involved in our education program. These include, of course, elders and ministers, deacons, teachers, coordinators, assistants. All of these people deserve our support. Some make a living at it and deserve what they receive. Others volunteer and deserve our gratitude. All of these, however, deserve our cooperation in getting our kids to class and maintaining our own presence and encouraging their efforts to teach the truth. You know, we're going to buy, you know, we'll buy an overpriced souvenir to support our sports hero. You know, we'll spend a hundred bucks to get a jersey with the name of our favorite sports person on it, or film star, but we often neglect to say thank you to those who are leading our souls and those of our children to heaven. How about a thank you to those people? How about a thank you to the Sunday school teacher who for 20 years has been Sunday after Sunday faithfully teaching children? How about a hundred bucks to get a t-shirt and put her name or his name on it. Those who teach the truth must also live by the truth. There's a double-edged sword there. 
Diotrephes may have denied hospitality and caused problems in the church out of a warped sense of duty to protect or defend a truth that only he saw. His actions, however, were contrary to the truth given by the apostles and received by the church. Demetrius, on the other hand, received affirmation because his actions coincided with the truth that he taught and that he received from the apostles. You know, it's not different to spot the fakes. Either their words don't match the words of Jesus or their actions don't match their words. Pretty simple. Figure that one out. Remember that those who aspire to teach have the dual responsibility of teaching only what is true and living according to that truth. Not to do this risks the lives of our students as well as our, as well as our own. One more here. Hospitality is still an important and necessary ministry. I know that we rely less on hospitality today to take care of our missionaries or our preachers, but hospitality is still crucial in the development of a New Testament church. If we're not sharing our homes, if we're not making strangers feel welcome, if we're not helping new families feel at home, we are neglecting a primary mission and ministry of the church, which is hospitality. Hospitality is inconvenient, it's expensive, it's time consuming, consuming, excuse me, but this is what makes it so pleasing to the Lord. When we offer hospitality, we are truly giving of ourselves and that's what makes it special and worthy of offering to the Lord. So let's remember that we or our parents or our children uh, will one day be strangers. One of these days, your kids are going to move to Dallas or move to, who knows, you know, somewhere, Chicago, I, I don't know, to spread their wings or to, to go to college or maybe they get married and they're just moving away, no more in that little family orbit. And they're going to be looking around for a church. You, you can't believe how many phone calls I get from worried parents. Uh, Brother Mike said, could you recommend a good church in so-and-so, Kansas? Or, your kid's going to be in a strange place one of these days and don't you wish when they walk into the building, they, you know, they've got a Linda Ziegler or they've got a Barbara Brandon there meeting them at the door and saying, welcome, come on in, you know, what's your name? You know, oh, these are your children. Well, let me help you find a class for those children. You know, don't you wish you, they have those people at their congregation to do that? So let's make sure that we do our part to keep this blessing going around. All right, uh, that was the last, uh, this is the last lesson in uh, first, second, third John. I hope you've enjoyed the series, learned something, been encouraged by it. Thank you for your attention. We're dismissed. <laughs>